I want to be remembered as a warrior. So the only way to do that is to cross those ropes and to, and to prove it to people. I believe I, I am, but unless I show it, no one's going to believe me. I don't want to be the guy that's, oh yeah, I'm so awesome, da da da. Yeah, any, any, everyone says that and everyone just looks at you, make you full of shit. But if you can rip out a billy and go, check out this, actions speak louder than words. One of my greatest fights is one of the fights that I lost, and that was to Yod in, in the final of the contender. Uh, he knocked me down round one, and then at the time my, my father was dying of cancer. All I could, all I could think about was um, just making sure I get up, because um, it was going to be the last time that he seen me fight, so I really wanted to um, make him proud. Let's say there's, there's six different kids' fights, so everyone's talking among themselves, and then we have Jazzy Pa, and everyone starts paying attention all of a sudden because they know yeah, it's just they that. have so high expectations of how she's going to perform, yeah. if she's a real power or if she's adopted. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up, my parents were horse trainers, so we lived on horse properties. Um, we were very secluded from everybody, living on farms. I'd watch the TV while mum and dad were working, and there was a TV show called Monkey Magic. And it'd be about uh, martial arts, using all the weapons, and using uh, all the martial arts techniques to beat the bad guys. I just had this, uh, desire that I wanted to be a martial artist. Um, I didn't know the difference between karate or taekwondo or boxing or I just knew I, I wanted to be a fighter. Um, and then when I started primary school, uh, rock and roll wrestling was so big. Uh, they had Hulk Hogan and all these other superstars. But there was one man that I was um, attracted to the most and he was named um, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat or something or other. And he was a martial artist and he was Asian. And, he, for some reason, he drew my attention the most because he was doing the kicks and doing all the, the, the super crazy stuff and I thought, I want to be this guy. And a friend of ours mentioned there was a, a Taekwondo school walking distance from our house. So uh, my, my mum was uh, super excited as well. So, so for the very first night, we, we both ran to the gym. There was only like five streets away, but uh, we thought we'd get a good lead up. You know, once we got there, my mum was so tired that she, she couldn't train. She was like, oh, you, you train, I'll just watch. So uh, I did my very first Taekwondo class and I just thought, this is so amazing. I, I, I fell in love with it straight away. And I remember doing the, the punches for the first time and hearing the snap of the punches. I thought, this is, I felt like a superhero. Uh, so I did Taekwondo for approximately a year and a half. I, I graded it a few different times and I went into my, my first uh, Taekwondo competition. Uh, I had the fight three times in, in one day. Um, winning two and losing in the final to a much uh, older uh, kid. Um, and then from that moment forward, I always had this desire that I wanted to go to Korea. I'd seen the TV where they all stand, hundreds of people stand in line and doing their carters. Oh, that's me. Oh, that's, oh, that's, this is my only desire. I only want to be Taekwondo. But unfortunately for me, the, the Taekwondo uh, closed. They, they, they couldn't make enough rent. So um, after they closed down, there was six months or so of limbo. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I, uh, I first feel lost. And then a friend of ours mentioned that kickboxing um, had moved into the same hall. I thought, oh, this is amazing, this is so cool. I'll, I'll, I'll do this until I find another Taekwondo school. So I did my first kickboxing class and then um, all of a sudden we were allowed punches to the head and it wasn't quite as flashy, but it, but it was a lot more practical. And I thought, yep, I'm done. I'm, uh, I, I want to be a, a kickboxer now. And then uh, it just so happened that the movie Kickboxer came with Van Damme and about a gentleman traveling to Thailand, fighting the Thais. Instead of going to Korea, I want to go to Thailand. And um, this is all at the age of uh, like approximately 13 years old. So, um, and that, that desire never disappeared. I just, I just had, for some reason, I had this uh, calling that I, I really had to, to travel to Thailand and, and, and train with the best. So after my first kickboxing fight at the age of 14, I lost in a very close fight, but I remember when I, when I copied out of the ring and as, as I was walking back to the change room, someone in the crowd said, way to go, Wayne. And then from that moment, the whole crowd erupted and gave me a, a massive round of applause. 
and it just felt like I was walking on a cloud from the ring back to the change room. And uh, even though I didn't win my fight, um, it were, it, the exhilaration of just having acceptance of, of being appreciated was, was so overwhelming that, that it were, that's when I made the conscious decision that this is what I want to do forever. I, I want to have this feeling. I moved to Bangkok for the very first time and, and now, now I was the only Westerner, not only in the gym, but in, in the whole city. It felt like I was in the whole city. Growing up, uh, I was one of those kids that uh, moved, moved a lot. Uh, I went to 11 different schools, um, never really got settled in any one place. Um, so uh, even though I, I was sort of always a little bit lost, um, when it came time to move to Thailand, I, I think that was what helped me, to, because I was so used to being the new guy and blending in with the, the, my surroundings that moving to a different country was quite easy. I had kids tugging on their parents' shirts, just pointing at me like I was some sort of alien. Which after a while, I, I got so used to that when I moved back to Australia again, I felt um, something was missing. I wasn't, the, I wasn't special anymore. I just blended in with everyone else. But when I was in Bangkok though, I felt really um, sp special. So, uh, and then once I started fighting on, on, on Thai TV and uh, making the newspapers and making the magazines, when I would run down the street, like, people would flash their lights at me and beep their horns and people would say hello to me and I, I just felt um, accepted after uh, five um, just small time fights. Um, Sang Tanoi had a, a really big fight in uh, north of Thailand. Uh, we went to the weigh-in um, and then uh, Song Chai, the promoter, was, was seemed very upset because uh, Danny Bill was supposed to fight on the show but he never appeared. They promoted a West Center to fight on the show and like, what are we going to do? Danny Bill's not here. And my trainer put his hand up and said, my kid will fight. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, don't worry, don't worry. He'll, he'll fight, he'll fight. And Song Chai said, he goes, oh, I don't know who this kid is. I can't put him against this, the superstar, Tai. Um, i tell you what I do. Does anyone in the room want to fight the West Center? And I swear, 50 hands went up and I just felt so scared. Song Chai called all the ones that were closest to my size and weight. And then uh, eventually we found one that was a, about my size. So it's all right, tomorrow um, you're going to fight. So, so not being 100% prepared and, and very um, scared. The next day I went to the show and it was one of those shows where it's outside in the middle of nowhere and there was 40,000 people um, in attendance. Um, because the promoter makes all the money from the TV, he doesn't even need to sell tickets. So people travel from far and wide to come and see like a proper, proper all the superstars. Uh, I was the first fight of the night and then I uh, ended up having a, a five round war where I got cut in the, in the fifth but I, I still did enough to win. After the fight Song Chai came into the dressing room and he said you did so well tonight. I'm so uh, upset that I didn't save you for the main card because you, you put on such a, a crazy fight. But to let you know from this moment forward you're going to be one of my fighters. Like, Whoa this is amazing Song Chai. I get to be a Song Chai fighter. So in that moment forward, um, I had another, another firefight for Song Chai um, being quite successful. Uh, I started fighting at Lumpini Stadium uh, and the best part was I, was I was the first Australian ever to fight at Lumpini. Uh, I, won, I won that fight by knockout in the fourth. So my, my 21st birthday was on the 25th of May and then my, my next fight was on the 30th of May. So uh, as growing up as a kid on your 21st, you always think you're gonna get a big party and everyone's gonna get drunk and it's gonna be the craziest, craziest night ever. But instead um, I was doing pads and losing weight and. I think I got a phone call from mum and back in, back in the 90s to, to make a phone call internationally was very expensive so to get a phone call was like a big deal and then mum rang up, hey happy birthday son, so that was, and then I, I think one of the girls in the neighbourhood she bought me a cupcake with a candle in it, happy 21st, it's like this is not how I imagine my 21st. One of the, the good things about fighting in Lumpini is if, if, if you win by knockout on TV um, you get presented with a gold chain. So I, I promised myself, I said, I'm gonna lock this guy out. I'm gonna give myself my own 21st birthday present. So the fight happened, um, and then I was very lucky to win by second round knockout uh, on Thai TV. I got my gold chain and I, I was so proud. But about a month later, um, I ran out of money and I had to go and hock my chain to, to make some money. So I, I was so upset because it wouldn't have been so cool, but, but at the same time, to give myself a, a 21st birthday present was amazing. And then. That was my, my ninth straight win in Thailand. So uh, Song Chai, um, he organized a, a photo shoot for me and a big interview for the number one selling magazine, Moi Siam. 
and then um, we went to a, a nice area with palm trees and, and water and uh, it, was, it was very cool. And then as the photographer came, I said, all right, I need you to stand very, very strong because this is for the front cover. Really? He goes, oh, you didn't know? Yeah, this is for the cover. Like, oh my God. So um, we did the photo shoot and about three days later, um, the magazine comes out and sure enough, um, I'm on the front cover of the, the number one selling mag. Apparently I was the first Westerner ever to make the front cover. So, um, and then for the next three or four days, um, the news agents aren't like here back home in Australia, they're, they're outside and um, they're, they're everywhere. So I'm um, pinned up on the thing, uh, wherever I went, I could see my face, all, all different shops, all, all different streets. And it's like, uh, this, is, this is like, a, I'm pinching myself. This is so crazy, this is so cool. Um, so the next fight, I, uh, I had to fight a gentleman called uh, Orono. Uh, he was my first A-class tie and my first uh, really big test. Yeah, and that one was a lot harder. That, this one, I ended up getting cut uh, 21 stitches. I got uh, 13 above my eyebrow, another eight under my eye. Um, the fight was stopped round three from the excessive bleeding. Um, and it was my first real taste of uh, what elbows really hurt. <laughs> When I first moved to Thailand, I'd only had 20 fights and I'm fighting guys with 100, 200, 300 fights, knowing that there's a good chance I'm going to get seriously hurt. Um, I, I used to um, have diarrhea, I used to vomit, I used to um, like lose sleep, I couldn't sleep. I used to have this bad anxiety where I could rate my opponent into the boogeyman. He'd be too strong, he'd be too fast. If I kick left, he'd counter right. If I threw a punch, he'd, he'd do something. I'd make all these scenarios in my head. I'd be mentally drained. And then the fight would start, and then it was like, it was nothing like that at all. I'd kick him, and he'd feel pain. It's like, this is crazy, what's going on? It's not, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to be the superhero. Then all of a sudden I realized they're just like me. They feel pain that I can hear them tired like me, and then I'd win. It's like, why am I wasting all this negative energy when they're just human, just like myself? So I, I soon learned to worry about me and not to not to think about the boogeyman because I'm creating something in my head that's not going to happen. So and then and then once I started doing that, I could get a good night's sleep now. Yeah, it becomes so much easier when I, the the main focus is just make sure I'm fit, I'm strong, um, I've got no injuries. It took me about 30 fights to realize that uh, end of the day we're all human. We all have the same anxiety. We all have the same uh, apprehension. We all have the same fears. So it's best um, believe in yourself. If you've done the work, you'll go into the ring much more confident if you believe in yourself. And then I, I get uh, inundated by people emailing me all the time saying, how I got my first fight, do you have any advice? So the best thing is just make, sh make sure you worry about you, do what you have to do, listen to your trainer, and um, the, rest, the rest is easy. Ish, ish, <laughs> One of my greatest fights is one of the fights that I lost and that was to Yod in, in the final of the contender. Uh, he knocked me down round one, and then at the time my, my father was dying of cancer. All I could... All I could think about was um, just making sure I get up, because um, it was going to be the last time that he seen me fight, so I really wanted to um, make him proud. <laughs> and um, and Yod Singlai knocked, <coughs> knocked me down again round two, I gotta get up, I gotta get up, I gotta, I gotta finish this fight, I gotta get up. And then um, I come back strong, round three, round four. Um, yeah, Yotsin Glade, we, we had a tough battle around the fifth round. To pull off a knockout, Wayne Paul launches a right hand and tags him on the jaw. Here comes Jake Tapia, here comes the Aussie. And Yotsin Glade ties him up. Yotsin Glade just locking down, keeping his base solid in his feet. Crossing Such emotion. And he's taunting Wayne Park. He is smoking Wayne Park. He is trying to sap Park mentally and power into right hand. Power into left hand. Oh, Wayne Park's been rocked, but he's still standing. Big debauchery game from Godson Clyde. Wayne Park's been cut over the left eye. Park's been cut over the left eye. Blood streaking down the cheek now. I didn't win the fight, but, but to this day, I'm so proud that uh, 
I finished my fight and I, and I made it as exciting as I could. When the fight got aired, uh, I, I took the laptop to the hospital and I, and I showed Dad the fight. And um, after, after the fight, I remember I was sitting on the chair beside the bed and he, he just put his arm around me and gave me a big hug. And he's like, mate, I'm so proud. He said, you can fight that guy 10 times and you're never gonna beat that guy. And then uh, after he passed, I uh, actually did fight US and Glow one more time and, and, and I beat him. And all I wanted to do was straight away, I just gotta ring. Oh, I just wanted to show you, Dad. I said, I did it, Dad. I know, I know you said I couldn't, but this one was for you, just to prove you that I could. Sorry. Every time it gets me, every time. It's so sad, but it's so important. It's so special too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one of my favorite pastimes is telling people about uh, my living conditions in Thailand. So uh, when I first got to Bangkok, I remember Sang Ten taking me around to the boxer room. Uh, he said, okay, this is where you're gonna sleep. And, and just like this wooden floor, there was 10 boxes side by side, no mattresses, just pillows and blankets on the floor that have a, a little bit of cushioning, just so you didn't have to rub it on the, on the wood. Um, so when I found my position, I, I tried to sleep right next to the wall. So I only had one arm and leg over me instead of two arms and legs over me on both sides. Um, so you, yeah, you wake up in the night, it's like, get off me. <laughs> and then, um, and then our, our bathroom. So, so not many people know about West uh, Asian cultures where they don't have a normal toilet. So they have the porcelain hole in the ground with little foot holders. And then you have to squat over the toilet and then there's no toilet paper. So we had this big basin with a plastic container that would float on top. So you pour the container and you pour it into your hand and you have to wipe, wipe your bottom with the, the water. So you have, to, you have to try and get the perfect water to the hand ratio. So not too much hand, not too much water. You gotta have to find that just right. Especially after eating chilies. Uh, you eat really spicy food and sometimes when you add the water you can see the steam coming off your butt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, it's so much better than toilet paper. So, so at the end of the day, if you had dirty hands, you don't wipe it with a paper towel, you, you wash them just like your butt. So it, it, it makes so much more sense to use water instead of paper. And then that same container, so we'd stand on the outside on the concrete and we'd, we'd pour the water on our body, we'd leather up with soap and then we'd pour the water off. And then uh, when it was time to brush our teeth, we'd brush our teeth and then we'd pour the container and we'd pour the water into our hand and then uh, rinse out and then add the fly. So, so between 10 different people, um, we're all uh, showering, we're all pooping, we're all brushing our teeth, it was crazy. And then uh, for somehow or other we didn't get sick or didn't get, uh, didn't get any, anything gastro or nothing. So the first few days I was, I was so intimidated to go to the toilet because like, oh, I don't know how to do this. But then uh, after a few weeks, a few months, a few years, uh, I, I even uh, become a pro where I can pour water, slide down my back so it dribbles down my butt so I get the per <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like a, it's like a, 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 a back crack waterfall. <laughs> uh, you can imagine living in a camp for six weeks with no female interaction. And then when we lived in uh, Butum Thani, um, sometimes you'd be running down the road and, and there'd be buffaloes in the paddock. And you'd start thinking, I swear that female buffalo is smiling at me. <laughs> I'm sure she just winked at me. Yeah. So, so, uh, so it's, it's nice to be back home and, and have a wife and a family. When you're living with, in with all males and everyone's fighting and training and the, the testosterone, and it's, uh, it does get very pent up. In the Thai culture, um, uh, you're not allowed to have your male stuff come out so you get strong, your male testosterone. Brrr. Yeah, you gotta abstain from uh, having long showers. <laughs> yeah, no long showers. So, uh, yeah, so weird. Uh, how do I say this? So it's funny because at the time I, I was a 19 year old boy and it's like, oh. <laughs> so let's, let's pretend I had an extra long shower. The very next day, every single time I did, um, the Thai trainers go, What'd you do last? What'd you do last night? You're not. Yesterday you were kicking the pad so hard, and today you got no power. What'd you do? And for somehow or other, every time they knew, it's like, damn it, this sucks. I usually go two weeks without uh, having no, 
no in, no long showers. And then uh, for the world title fights, um, I, I even go three weeks. So three weeks and then, uh, yeah, you get so strong and so angry and so you must testosterone. So, uh, um, but yeah, it's a, a different, different culture, different, different way of living. So, but uh, yeah, it, it was tough, especially when you're in that environment where there's no girls and it's like all the boys and it's like, because yeah, yeah, there's no privacy either, so it's not like you can just um, lock the door and do anything silly. So yeah, the good old days. Yeah, good memories. So in Muay Thai, the name of the game is winning by um, devastation. After so many fights and so many years in the sport, uh, my actually gym motto is uh, the people hurting business. Uh, and business is good. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so the name of the game is to try and create as much uh, chaos and uh, pain as possible so, so you win before the end of the bill. Uh, yeah, there's, there's been times where I've, I've had my opponent in the clinch and I'm just as I'm about the knee in the face, it's like, oh, I feel so bad right now. And it's like, and then you feel everything just crunch on your knee. It's like, oh, I'm glad that's not me. But at the same time, it's, it's better you than me because I don't want to feel that either. And so many times before going to the ring, uh, let's say I'm fighting a Yodzing guy, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to the hospital 100% after this fight, no doubt. Um, but I'm making a lot of money, so, so it's okay. Um, yeah, yeah, if I know I'm, I can pay my bills for the next three months, I'm willing to put myself in hospital. Uh, if, if I can win, amazing, but at the same time, as long as I'm getting paid, um, and as long as I put up a good performance as well. I remember the last time I fought Yod, the first time he knocked me down with a head kick. Uh, the second time he knocked me down twice with punches and he, and he cut me two different times. And then the third time that we fought, I remember as we were walking to the ring, I'm just thinking, oh man, this is gonna hurt so bad but I'm making a lot of money, so, all right, let's see what happens. He ended up cutting me again, another one under the cheek and another one through the eyebrow. I felt like he broke my arm again, but uh, I, on a split points decision, I was lucky to just steal it. It was so amazing, it was, it was so worth it, but you just gotta have that mindset. Um, there's no way I know I'm getting out of this fight injury free, but I'm willing to put myself in that situation to, to, to be remembered. As long as I, I fight the best of my abilities, if I win, lose, or draw, sometimes you get beaten by the better man of the day. You can't help that. Um, you might beat me today, but I swear I'm gonna go back to the gym, train twice as hard, you're not gonna beat me tomorrow. It's a funny sport. It's a funny sport knowing that you're gonna get hurt and knowing that you're probably gonna hurt him a lot as well. Um, but, but it's something that I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice to, to be remembered. In the limited time that I, I'm here, I want to leave a mark. I want my kids proud, I want my family proud. And if I pass, I want people to look back upon my career and think I want to emulate what John Wayne created. I want to go to Thailand, I want to fight the Thais. I want to live there and I want to learn to speak Thai. My advice for anyone getting into the sport is uh, you have to have uh, the passion. Uh, without the passion, uh, you can only go so far. Uh, there's so many times where I've had the, the amazing highs, but I've also had the crazy lows where, I remember I lost four fights in a row back in the 2005, 2006. And at the crossroads, like, what do I do? I don't want to give up. I, I, this is what I love, but I'm not winning. I'm, 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 they're close, but I'm not getting the, the, the points that I, I need. I'm not getting the, uh, so it's just about the passion and the focus. Overcoming adversity, knowing that Sometimes things aren't going to go your way, but how bad do you want it? Um, if you're willing to, to, to just knuckle down and, and, and create your own success, um, no one's going to give you a, on a platter, no one's going to just hand it to you. You have to work hard for it. it. It's such a satisfying feeling to know that you've been at the bottom and to slowly work your way back up to become famous. is, is uh, it's, it's so amazing. It's so... It's so, uh, so rewarding. Um, you, you can't buy it. You, you can't buy hard work. You can't buy the, the, the satisfaction of having your hand raised in front of all the crowd and getting a standing ovation. You can't appreciate the good times without the bad times. And with, with that passion and um, determination, it, it just shows that hard work can achieve anything. Another leading factor of trying to be successful 
is money. Yeah, the more you win, the more your money goes up, and then it's like, wow, I can't believe I'm making this amount of money to do something that I love. I feel bad. I feel bad watching people go to work every day, and I get to stay home and 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 and, and chill out during the lunch times and have a little nap and train again in the afternoon. And um, if I wasn't being paid for doing what I'm doing, I'd be paying someone to teach me to do what I do. So either way, I'd still be doing it. I'm so fortunate I turned my hobby into a career. So to get paid for something that I love doing, it's like, I, I, I feel dirty. Um, it's like, I, I should be, I should have a job, but. <laughs> Through my sponsors, I've been very lucky to open my very own gym at the end of 1999. So, so 20 years now, I've been a, a gym owner. It, it was so crazy when I first started teaching classes, I had no idea what I was doing. I was guessing how I was gonna run my classes. I was guessing my memberships. Um, I was guessing my gym structure. Um, I remember if someone asked me if I could do a private lesson, it's like, oh, what the hell is a private lesson? Um, and then uh, even like for seminars, like what do, I, what do I teach? And then I've been so fortunate to do so many now that it's, uh, and, and teaching classes every day. And um, now I've come to a, have, having, a, having a system where I know what works, know what doesn't work, know how to talk to people, know how to uh, lift people up. Uh, and then making sure that every single student, um, I treat them as my best friend. They might annoy me. Some people are, are very irritating, but at the same time, you have to put on the, the coach's mask and, um, and, and have a positive attitude. With that positivity, um, it, people feed off it. And all of a sudden, they have a, their, their self-belief and they can see themselves improving every day also. Uh, and it's so satisfying to have somebody come into the gym that has no idea about how to hold their hands up or how to keep their feet or their footwork to see them um, compete for the first time or for the 10th time and to see them win their the very first trophy to their very first belt. Um, yeah, so not only do they win, but we win as a team. And uh, that, that's what makes it so rewarding to, to know that through your guidance that they've, they've created their own legacy. So living in Thailand for so long, uh, Thailand Muay Thai and Western Muay Thai are completely, completely different scenarios. In Thailand, fighting and training is a job. They compete for money, the camp takes a percentage, um, and the camp survives off all the fighters. So if they can't be successful, then the gym uh, loses their reputation as one of a strong gym. Whereas in Western culture, 90% uh, uh, of my clientele are coming in just for fitness and fun. Um, they don't want to compete. They just, they just want to have a sweat. Uh, and then with a positive attitude, um, I can make uh, people really enjoy themselves as well. Instead of me going rah, 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 I'll suggest they do uh, this or that. And if they don't pick it up straight away, I've, I've learned to just, j just walk away. As long as they're not hurting themselves, just, just walk away and then come back and we'll try and fix it again tomorrow. And then if that doesn't work, I'll come back again tomorrow and, and, and then slowly and slowly and slowly um, help them adjust their, their technique. Um, in Thailand, uh, it's, a, it's a way different because if you're not winning, your prize money is going down, which affects the, the gym's uh, finances, finances as well. So, uh, but Westerners, uh, it's just, just fun. Um, there's, there's, there's no pressure to be uh, uh, amazing. Um, they just want to have a sweat, lose a few kilos, have a bit of self-confidence um, and, and walk out of the gym with a smile. Whereas in Thailand, I've had so many fights where I've won and then on the, the ride back to the gym, just being yelled at and, and um, just told all the negatives that I did wrong in the fight. Even though I won, they're, they're so um, pedantic on telling you, you missed this check or you didn't catch that kick or why did you do this? And in fact, I've even, I've even got in trouble for uh, knocking a guy out uh, too early because the, the camp didn't have an opportunity to put money on the fight. They said, didn't you hear us yelling out? Um, not yet, not yet. Um, take your time, take your time. But, but because you knocked him out in round two, we didn't, have, we didn't have a chance to put our money on you. So that fight was a complete waste of time. I said, yeah, but I won. So we don't care you won. We didn't get make any money. It's like, ah. <laughs> I've been so lucky to have uh, 147 fights now. And, and now that I've, I've come to the end of the road where um, injuries have been so bad that I have no other option but to retire. But now I'm in that transition of going from fighter to normal. And I'm, I'm sort of having a really hard time right now. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to do anything else. My, I've had 147 fights. 
I just want to fight forever. And I don't know, I don't know how I can find happiness without having fighting in my life. Yeah, sad. <laughs> when, when I was preparing for my very last fight, uh, I had to do a, a fitness test at the doctors. And I was telling him about my hip and I was telling him about this could be my last fight. And even he even mentioned, he said, I, if you ever have a hard time mentally after you retire, I know what it's like for a professional sportsman to all of a sudden retire and um, not have that special thing in their life anymore. It's quite difficult. So, um, and I didn't really think much of it at the time, but now that I have retired and, and um, I don't know, it just, it just it feels like I'm, I'm missing an arm or a leg. I'm, it's really hard to, because I love it so much, and uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to be normal. I like getting in front of the crowd, and I like competing, and I like, I like having a date, like we mentioned before. I like preparing. I like having six weeks, just that the big build up. I like the anxiety of laying in my pillow and, and knowing that I'm fighting like a proper killer, like a Yodson guy or a boar cow or a Michael Zambides. And just having that um, anxiety, like, oh, even though it's scary, it's, it's exhilarating. Um, so, yeah, to, hit, to all of a sudden wake up and think, oh, when am I going to have for breakfast? It's like, it's so boring. It's so boring compared to the exhilaration of, of just competing. It's like, it so sucks. How do I deal with haters? Uh, I'm so fortunate that I really don't have that many haters. I think people enjoy my personality where I like to have a laugh. Uh, I laugh at myself. Life is so short and to, to take myself seriously, I'm, uh, I get so much satisfaction out of just taking the piss out of myself and just making people, if, if someone's laughing because I've, I've made a joke, I feel so happy. Hi, my name is Jasmine Pa. I'm currently a Muay Thai fighter. Um, I've had 25 fights, and in two weeks I'll be fighting over in Bangkok for my 26th fight. I've been very lucky to um, travel all over the world with Muay Thai. I fought in Canada, England. Uh, this will be my third fight in Thailand, and I fought in Australia. And then this is my dad, Jamain Pa. Hi. <laughs> Because I've always grown up in the gym, the, like the first place I went to when I came out of the hostel was, was the gym. Like even from a young age, I always was training with my mom or my dad just for fun. And then when I was about seven, I, I sort of said to my parents that I wanted to have a fight. And um, they said, when you're eight years old. And when I turned eight, um, I said, oh, can I fight now? I'm eight. And yeah, they let me fight. So that was the beginning of my story. <laughs> so I love the thrill of fighting. Like everything is so amazing. Like. It's like an art. You see all the athletes and the way they're leading up for the fight and then how they actually perform in the ring or in the cage. It's, it's like a surreal experience and getting to actually like experience it for yourself, it's like a feeling like you can't even explain. Sometimes, I, well, most of the time I feel a lot of pressure, especially when you're training. Like I guess everyone can sort of be their own worst enemy at some point. You just gotta know whether or not like that my parents are fighters, I still gotta do it for me. When I'm fighting, I don't sort of think about all the other pressure. A lot of people say to me, like, oh, you're just like your dad, or you're just like your mom, but like, I sort of just want to be known for being my own fighter. So my goals for this year is really, I just want to just train and I want to fight as hard as I can and really get my name out there. And hopefully next year I'm 18, there'll be some really big opportunities and I just got to show the world what I'm, I'm capable of and um, yeah, just do my best. It's sort of funny because on the promotion, let's say there's there's six different kids fights, so everyone's talking among themselves, da, da, da. and then we have Jazzy Pa, and everyone starts paying attention all of a sudden because they know yeah, it's just they, that. They, they have so high expectations of how she's going to perform if yeah. if she's a real power or if she's adopted. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool because um, seeing Jazzy in the gym every day and, and watching her train so hard and to hold the pads and, and to feel how much power she can generate. Uh, her, her power to weight ratio is quite impressive, um, even as a trainer, um, not just because she's my daughter, but um, as, a, as a student, when she hits the pads, it's quite powerful. And um, 
it's very impressive. So, so when it is time to compete, um, I believe in her abilities because I know how she's prepared for the fights. Um, and then I have to take my, my father hat off and put my trainer hat on and I can't have that emotion where, oh, that's my little girl. I just gotta go, all right, this is what you have to do. Um, all right, this round we didn't check as much, so we've got to start checking more or, or use your range and start using your teeth. But uh, as a father, um, oh, ooh, 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 no, no, my poor little girl. I said, ah, what are you doing? <laughs> You're not bleeding enough. <laughs> Get in there. Every time she fights, it's, uh, it makes me very proud to be, be a dad. It's pretty cool having parents that also do Muay Thai because they can just sort of relate with everything. Like if I have a fight coming up, they just know how I'm feeling mentally and knowing like getting physically prepared for a fight, they know what I have to do and like just they know how to um, guide me through the right path. And yeah, it's really like inspirational having parents that have done so much in the sport. You sort of just want to try and do so much as well to just be as good as them. Doing Muay Thai has just like really shapes my life with everything. You, it's like I said before, there's such an art in Muay Thai, like with the respect and the discipline. You've got to sacrifice a lot to be a Muay Thai fighter and I think that's what makes it so good to work for because there's so much to achieve. When you win a fight or just doing having that experience, is, it's just a surreal feeling that no one could ever like put into words. and. Do, like after all the sacrifice and all the hard work, it's it's always worth it. It's funny uh, when Jazzy was coming up the ranks, uh, she was doing an interview recently. I said, "Oh, what's your main motivation?" My main motivation is one day I'm going to have more belts than my dad. <laughs> like what? <laughs> what the hell? Where did this come it's from? It's good. It's good. That's yeah, good it's expectations. It's good, but it, it sort of sucks too because I don't want you beating me either. <laughs> 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 I raised the bar very high, so and then she's like, "Ha." That bar's gonna be easy. Watch this. Here, Dad, hold my chocolate milk. Yeah. 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 My name is John Wayne Parr. I'm a 10 time world Muay Thai champion. Uh, I've had 147 fights with my boxing and my Muay Thai. Uh, I've been very lucky to, to live in Thailand for five years training in the Thai camps. Uh, I won two of my world titles in Bangkok. Um, and yeah, I've been very lucky to, to live the dream um, fighting all over the world and uh, representing Australia.